Good evening. Uh, I'm glad to see you all came out tonight for Howard Nimrod's poetry reading. Introductions, uh, in my experience anyway, fall into two categories, those that run too long and those that don't run long enough. <clears throat> Given these options, I'm determined to be guilty of the latter offense, though I must confess it's not easy to be brief about so distinguished a man as Howard Nemirov. A complete listing of his awards alone could consume several minutes, and a listing of his publications in the form of novels, short stories, drama, and essays to say nothing of the poetry would take considerably longer. Suffice it to say that recognition of Mr. Nemirov's work has steadily increased since the publication of his first volume of poetry in 1947. And last year, he was awarded both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award for his collected poems. <clears throat> These recent honors simply confirm what many of us have known for years, that Howard Nemirov is among the best poets of our time. Perhaps the most distinctive quality of Mr. Nemirov's poetry is its accessibility, that is, its readability. And this alone distinguishes it from much of contemporary verse which at times resists, even defies, understanding. It was this quality which prompted a young man in a Pennsylvania college to write Mr. Nemirov to say the following. I'm doing my term paper on you because although they say you have to read poems twice to understand them, I can manage with one reading of your poems. <laughs> Perhaps this student was deceiving himself a bit, but he was astute enough to see a clarity of style and the poems thank God, did not set the dogs on him, but invited him in. This is not to say that Mr. Nemirov's poetry lacks profundity, but rather that it reflects what is most difficult for the artist to accomplish, a clear depth, a well-wrought simplicity. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Howard Nemirov. Good evening, and uh, does this little thing work? Nobody heard me? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it would be usual for nobody here you say, does this little thing work? I was in a symposium about all this nonsense in New York once, and Robert Graves and Marianne Moore and Stanley Kunitz have been going on for 20 minutes expressing themselves and somebody asked me something and I said, does the microphone work? And everybody said, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, going to read you some verses. The nice thing about small verses is that if you don't like one, another will be along in a minute. Um, I don't know which verses, except I always start with kind of uh, little neck verses I call gnomes or gnomes. They're uh, squat and ugly, but the hope is they sometimes have powerful jaws. This one is called Love, an interesting subject, and it's only two lines long. A sandwich and a beer might cure these ills if only boys and girls were bars and grills. <laughs> uh, it just sort of comes over slowly and I like, <laughs> like that. As for this thing sliding around, it's, um, I'll try not to make it slide around, but I remember at West Point when I leaned at the thing and it sunk through the floor. <laughs> It's the biggest laugh I ever got. <laughs> the technicians had to go below and raise me up like the witches in Macbeth. <laughs> Another one of these gnomes called the sacrificed author. It's if you want to be a writer, you, you think ahead to your first book, but uh, nobody ever remembers to think ahead to when it gets reviewed. Um, woo, terror weapon. This is only slightly blasphemous. A sacrificed author, father he cried after the critics chewing, 
Forgive them, for they know not what I'm doing. That was about a guy uh, I won't identify further because I think his whole purpose over our 30 years acquaintance has been to scrape acquaintance. Uh, but after he wrote that review, he sent word by a friend we had in common that he didn't mean it. He was sorry, but he was feeling bad. Didn't go out of the house afraid to see people and so forth. I would have thought so. Uh, <laughs> So I, I sent back word by our friends, and well, all right, you know, go sin no more. I must have been feeling very Christ-like those days, <laughs> something you get over. Uh, <laughs> I said a saying of my wife's, worst things have happened at sea. So he did it five more times. <laughs> so, some 30 years afterward, I said as follows to my least favorite reviewer. When I was young, just starting at our game, I ambitioned to be Christ-like and forgive thee. For a mortal Jew, that proved too proud an aim. Now it's my humbler hope just to outlive thee. <laughs> We'll crawl on toward the sublime presently, but uh, let's stick with these little things. You know, reviewers hate for me to do these things, because I think I found a joke somewhere else and then just rhymed it, but it's not true. I made up some of these jokes myself. <laughs> this is called, What Kind of Guy Was He? You know, when you're at a party and Somebody comes in, you don't know, and he goes out, and people turn to you and say in that terrible Harvard manner, who is that? <laughs> and, uh, and you say you don't know. Well, here's an all-purpose answer to that question. Just so you shouldn't have to ask again, he was the kind of guy that if you said something and you were the kind of, that if he said something and you were the kind of guy that said you can say that again, He'd say it again. <laughs> well, always a question where you go from where. I used to think I know, knew my way through these things when there were very few of them, and uh, I couldn't get through an hour without I talk very slowly in between selections. And even so, I never did as well as I heard hear Mary Ann Moore do once when she got through a hour's poetry reading on two and a quarter poems. She was <laughs> so fluent in between. Then I got to the point where I said, well, if these poems have an obvious disposition. This one follows that one, and that one follows the other one. You can see the thematic leading connections. And then it got this fat, and I can't see any thematic leading connections at all. So I, I suppose the only principle that remains to me is change the, turn, the, the tone once in a while. Um, one of the ways in which I wish to change the tone at the moment is um, a couple of riddles. So I, I published these in poetry. There were three of them. I'm not going to give you all of them. But under the title Querendo in Veniatis, seek and ye shall find, because I had a notion that, that the only good thing about that strict old new criticism I was brought under when I was a boy was that you did ask what it meant if you were supposed to look at it and say, oh yes, I see, there is some absolutely precise thing going on here. And I published it under that title because I figured, let's see, nobody's even going to know these are riddles. And sure enough, nobody wrote to the editor complaining that the answers weren't printed. They didn't know there was any answers. <laughs> well, okay. I've never been able to solve a riddle um, by myself, but sitting in a Greyhound bus in a snowstorm, stuck in it outside Portland, Maine, I suddenly made up five riddles. 
and three of them seemed all right. It is a spiral way that trues my arc towards central silence and my unreached mark, singing and saying till his time be done. The traveler does nothing, but the road goes on. Well, I'll give it to you one more time and you have some. <laughs> You have four seconds, and I'll give you the answer. Suspense is not part of the business. Huh? <laughs> it is a spiral way that trues my arc towards central silence and my unreached mark. Singing and saying till his time be done, the traveler does nothing, but the road goes on. One of the answers frequently given is a toilet bowl. I can understand it. <laughs> if the spiral movement is quite correct, but it doesn't get anything else. It's the tone arm moving across the record. And once you get that, you see that it's right. <laughs> Even a little idea like riddles, which I think are close to the heart of poesy, They've got to be right, like a joke. And they're puzzling when you don't know the answer. And when you do know the answer, you say, yep, just like a joke. And when you know the answer, then they're not puzzling, but they're mysterious, because, of course, this compound of motions reflects the not very subtle or shrewd or sophisticated ways in which we have been able to think about the nature of time. That is, time either going around in a circle so that the further you get from Christmas, the nearer you're getting to Christmas. Or in our secular time, it goes straight out, either from or toward, as I think Augustine was the first to say flat out, a future that doesn't exist to a past that doesn't exist through a present that when you shake it down doesn't exist. Um, I'm a pedant. I have to give a little lecture on things. It's a, a wonderful example. You throw a ball straight up in the air, and uh, when it stops at the top, and begins to come down there where it stops at the top, that is now. But, says my informant, a wonderful thinker named Kumaraswamy, who used to be a curator of the Oriental stuff in the Boston Museum, but the ball doesn't stop at the top, because throwing a ball straight up is just the limiting case of throwing a ball into any trajectory, whatever, and you would never say a fly ball stopped at the top and began coming down. It doesn't stop. So now, he said, is that moment at which the ball does not stop, but begins to come down. Cute, huh? Which um, led a poet to say, oh, I see, now is a razor made of glue. A friend of his, Owen Barfield, had said, a metaphor takes no harm from being absurd. <laughs> In fact, it may be all the better, because then you know it's a metaphor, not the literal fact, but you can see that nobody makes razors out of glue, and yet now has the double function of separating the future from the past, but also binding the future to the past, so therefore, and so on, and so forth. And, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, that riddle you could have got by simply being nuts. Um, <laughs> This one, I would declare you could get only by being nuts on my frequency. It has that wonderful old title reminding me of the dear days when I visited here last, about nine years ago, you know, when people were making non-negotiable demands all over the lot. There was a, a student leader who was said to be making non-negotiable demands on me, and he was coming to see me late in the evening, but fortunately we both fell asleep. Um, it's called Power to the People. 
Why are the stamps adorned with kings and presidents? Well, you have four seconds to respond. No, of course not. Why are the stamps adorned with kings and presidents that we may lick their hinder parts and thump their heads? <laughs> Oh, no, it's, well, we got going on the good old days. I last saw Will here. Here's another one. People in Washington kept me up all night saying I should write a poem in favor of peace. Well, oh, peace, wonderful, marvelous. What are you going to do, write a poem in favor of it? Everybody, I would think, is moderately in favor of it if you don't have to do anything warlike to secure it. But they kept me up saying, you oh, know, this is your duty. You know? And I thought of the mix of, the, there used to be at that time, some of you remember, um, things called read-ins. There were all sorts of ins, like sit-ins. And dirty, don't talk. Uh, <laughs> where all these guys and girls would get up on their hind legs in some hall rented for the occasion and read poems in favor of peace. How you ever got peace by standing up and reading your own nasty little verses to the great unwashed, I never understood, so I never did it. Still, those, that was the spirit of the time. So I finally did write them their peace poem. It was called On Being Asked for a Peace Poem. I was remembering, I think, William Yeats's on being asked for a war poem. And I guess the background to that was, you know, war poems are supposed to write something like Tipperary that will get the troops out there marching with a lilt and a swing in the stride. And I don't know if I can remember Yeats's verse now after all these years. I'll try. I think it better that in times like these a poet's mouth be silent, for in truth we have no gift to set a statesman right. He has had enough of pleasing who can please a young girl in the indolence of her youth or an old man upon a winter's night. Well, Yeats was greater, but I'm funnier. <laughs> or, um, maybe Yeats is, as Auden said, silly, but I'm funny. On being asked for a peace poem. Here is Joe Blow, the poet, sitting before the console of the giant instrument that mediates his spirit to the world. He flexes his fingers nervously. He ripples off a few scale passages. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And resolutely readies himself to begin his poem about the war in Vietnam. This poem, he figures, is a sacred obligation, all by himself applying the immense leverage of art. He is about to stop this senseless war. So Homer stopped that dreadful thing at Troy by giving the troops the Iliad to read instead. <laughs> so Wordsworth stopped the revolution when he felt that Robespierre had gone too far. So Yevtushenko was invited in the times to keep the Arabs out of Israel by smiting once again his mighty lyre. Joe smiles. He sees the Nobel Prize already and the reading of his poem before the General Assembly, followed by his lecture to the Security Council about the creative process. Probably some bright producer would put it on TV. <laughs> Poetry might suddenly be the in thing. Only trouble was he didn't have a good first line. Though he thought that for so great a subject it would be right to start with, oh. <laughs> Something he would not normally have done. Oh. And follow on by making some demands of a strenuous sort upon the muse polyhymnia of sacred song that lady with the fierce gaze and the implacable small smile. Well, that would lead to another thing if I could remember its title. Um, 
because it was about one muse, this was supposed to be about another one, Cleo, the muse of history. Um, yes, I can find it, because in the index it begins with two. That's simple, isn't it? We're getting more serious, but only very slowly and only a little. To Cleo, muse of history, on learning that the Etruscan warrior in the Metropolitan Museum of Art has proved a modern forgery. Well, this is a very strange subject because when I was a little boy, my daddy took me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was this mighty terracotta figure on a plinth a few feet high, so he's, you know, about seven feet high himself. And I suppose this hand held once a spear, and this hand held once a shield, but they're gone. And I can't remember what I thought then. Probably I was most preoccupied with the fact that looking up at this fellow, he's wearing a little skirt and his balls are hanging out. <laughs> and they're a little bit chipped about a bit, just, you know, if you come down from uh, something BC, yours would be too. <laughs> and uh, then about the time I took my firstborn to the museum and showed him this mighty statue, uh, people proved by methods of manufacture and so forth that it had been made by three Sicilian brothers in 1910. <laughs> of course, your genitals wouldn't be in such good shape if you'd only come down from 1910. But uh, they didn't break the thing up and uh, bury it. They, they put it somewhere off in respectable obscurity on the second floor in a glass case and signs marked fraud, do not believe, and so forth. And <laughs> funny thing is I would continue to believe it is a magnificent work. Well, my daddy always said when you got a complaint, you just don't fool around with the whistle polishers, you go right to the top. So I said this to Cleo, muse of history, she can take care of it. One more casualty, one more screen memory penetrated at last to be destroyed in the endless anamnesis, always progressing, never arriving at a cure. My childhood in the glare of that giant form corrupts with history, for I too fought in the war. He, great male beauty that stood for the sexual thrust of power, his target eyes inviting the universal victim to fatal seduction, the crested and grieved survivor long after shield and sword are dust, has now become another lie about our life. Smash the idol, of course, bury the pieces deep as the interest of truth requires, and you may in time compose the future smoothly without him, though it is too late to disinfect the past of his huge effigy by any further imposition of your hands. But tell us no more enchantments, Cleo. History has given and taken away. Murders become memories, and memories become the beautiful obligations. As with a dream interpreted by one still sleeping, the interpretation is only the next room of the dream. For I remember how we children stared, learning from him unspeakable things about war that weren't in the books, and how the museum store offered for sale his photographic reproductions in full color with the ancient genitals blacked out. It's a kind of flat way to end it, but it seemed to me that that idea of reproduction, photographic and otherwise, just, uh, just was the way it ought to go. Well, I would like to read you a, a, a new poem or two, or three or four or five even. Um, and we got on the theme of war. This one relates to the war by my history, not, not in the poem itself. It's got a little story attached to it. It's called The Little Aircraft. 
in the RAF he said aircraft instead of airplane. I was always stuck to it. I guess it's modeled on the little engine that could, which your children always loved somehow, you know. Um, and this is the story. I used to fly a bit in the war, and um, I've been away from it for a long time. And I was being taken by a small aircraft from, uh, I guess, Binghamton, New York, to Albany. And it was snowing like mad, and there's, you know, nothing to see. And us passengers already slightly green in the face go out on the tarmac, and the guy who's going to fly it, and the sandy little man, he doesn't even wear a funny hat, and there are no four stripes on his sleeve. He's just wearing a windbreaker. Doesn't inspire confidence at all. But I kind of waited and snuck up and sat beside him. And there were dual controls. And off we went, and on there nothing to see. And there's a little squawking going on. And I can't hear what he says back. But I can hear a little bit of the squawk. And I thought, my favorite fantasy, Howard, he's going to have a coronary. You're going to have to get us down. See? <laughs> and uh, I figured my recipe for getting us down would be to uh, say, well, I'm going to fly down out of these clouds till I see where we're going, then I'll hit a mountain. <laughs> Real clever stuff. Um, but by the time I had sat there for half the journey, I was beginning to figure out the little stuff that was coming over the loudspeaker over my head. Because, you know, it's uh, like so much in communication, and those who study poetry might use it as a sort of model. If you know about what he's going to say, you'll know what he says. But not, not if you don't. If you know in what order you to expect the instructions, then you get the instructions pretty well, you know. Just a few weeks ago, somebody, I was the only passenger on a similar little airplane. The guy let me fly it, and I began to get the, the hang of it again. Um, but I was impressed by this mortal miracle that it's, it's kind of fake religious parable. If you trust enough, you've got this whole system working for you. Only you mustn't try to do it on your own. You just listen and do exactly what you're told, and by God, the runway comes up, and so forth. Well, that's the story. The little aircraft. The little aircraft trudging through night, cloud, rain, is neither alone nor lost amid the great inverted ocean of the air. For a lane invisible gives it intelligence. The crossing needles keep its heading right. The neutrally numbering voices of its friends make of its blindness blind obedience. From one to another, handing its destiny on the stages of the way with course and height, till finally it's funneled in and down over the beacons along the narrowing beam, perfectly trusting a wisdom not its own, that breaking out of cloud it may be come back to this world and to be born again into the valley of the flare path, fallen home. You know, I wrote that, well, I guess I had several tries at it over the last four years, but I wrote it finally last summer, and remembered that that valley of the flare path, with its reminiscence of the 23rd Psalm, was just, I had thought of that phrase in 1944 in England. It's funny how those things will stay with you. Another more recent poem than the collected poems called The Makers. You know, you're allowed to write poems when you're a kid and you start out. You don't never think about language at all. Language is just something that's there. I've noticed students don't even know it's there. They think that, you know, you've got this one-to-one -one relation with nature, history, or whatever, God, and they go, uh, well, of course, I just said it. Until you begin to see, well, somebody in the 19th century said with great surprise, the entire face of nature is covered with a mask of theory. And the theory is, of course, language. And nobody knows how it got started, except me. I will tell you first, before the poem, how it got started. 
It was called Origin. I went way back and asked the old ones deep in the grave, the youngest dead, how language began and who had the credit of it, God, men, devils, elves. And this is the answer I was told. We got together one day, they said, and talked it over among ourselves. <laughs> So, well, this is a poem on the same theme called The Makers, which is the old word, the Scotch word, the Makaris in Dunbar's Lament for the Makers. Poets in the Greek, the, word, the words about poetry are words for making something. So they got to be called the Makers. Who can remember back to the first poets the greatest ones, greater even than Orpheus. No one has ever remembered that far back or now considers among the artifacts and bones and cantilevered inference the past is made of, those first and greatest poets, so lofty and disdainful of renown they left us not a name to know them by. They were the ones that in whatever tongue worded the world that were the first to say star, water, stone, that said the visible and made it bring invisibles to view in wind and time and change, and in the mind itself that minded the hitherto idiot world and spoke the speechless world and sang the towers of the city into the astonished sky. They were the first great listeners attuned to interval relationship and scale, the first to say above, beneath, beyond. Conjurers with love, death, sleep, with bread and wine, who having uttered vanished from the world, leaving no memory but the marvelous magical elements, the breathing shapes and stops of breath we build our babbles of. Remarkable to consider what, how much more is hidden in those 26 letters. You can sort of see what mathematicians are about. You know, you've got these things you can count on the fingers of both hands and the permutations of, well, no more lectures, okay. All right, we we'll just have to stop. But this is, uh, I would think, uh, an experience lots of us have had, that is to see something and then to dream it quite plain, not enciphered, many years afterward, just to see it again, but now asleep. Is it fairly common? Hmm. Well, of course, many of you are not old enough to have all the years necessary to do that over a decade or so. Well, but now I've uh, cued you in, listen for it. Two girls. I saw again in a dream the other night something I saw in daylight years ago. A path in the rainy woods, a shaft of light, and two girls walking together through shadow, through dazzle, till I lost them on their way in gloom embowering beyond the glade. The bright oblivion that belongs to day covered their steps, nothing of them remained, until the darkness brought them forth again to the rainy glitter and the silver light, the ancient leaves that had not fallen then. Two girls going forever out of sight, talking of lovers maybe and of love. Not that blind life they'd be the mothers of. Uh, you have to have a little Bible for this one. History of hair from World War II to the present. <laughs> and it uses the legal abbreviation Ux for wife, Uxor. 
crew cut at Oaks have raised their long-haired pup. Samson is shorn and Absalom's hung up. <laughs> oh dear, still a matter of finding things, isn't it? You know. Yes, it's called the tapestry. It's one of those poems where once you get the figure that there is a front side of the tapestry and a back side to the tapestry, you don't need to do any fancy poetry writing. You just put it down and let everybody else figure what it's about. It um, could stand for 20, 30 other things. The tapestry. On this side of the tapestry, there sits the bearded king, and round about him stand his lords and ladies in a ring. His hunting dogs are there, and armed men at command. On that side of the tapestry, the formal court is gone, the kingdom is unknown. Nothing but thread to see, knotted and rooted thread spelling a world unsaid. Men do not find their ways through a seamless maze, and all direction lose in a labyrinth of clues, a forest of loose ends where sowing never mends. There are two poems that seem to me to go with it, maybe by being almost in the same shape. Um, and maybe because of a certain despair over things that hits everybody at some time. This is called Myth and Ritual. I used to teach at a college in Vermont called Bennington, uh, where Stanley Edgar Hyman taught a very popular course called Myth and Ritual on the ritual origin of myth. I mustn't go into that because it was such a marvelous and famous theory. Uh, but it's a great lesson about knowledge, too, that it stands upon no particular attested fact. <laughs> but while it's going, while it's glamorous, nobody notices that. You always assume that all those facts must come from somewhere factual. There must be a country called fact where they <laughs> manufact these things. And it's also, uh, we, the faculty, some of them, we used to play a poker game is a little too expensive for faculty member. I think I set the record for losing 380 something in a night. And that was a night I had a royal flush and won <laughs> $200 on it too. So uh, I always said that I had neither luck, skill, nor courage. But you did learn, sort of. But the myth point about this ritual was that the faculty that didn't play and the players included the president of the college, our family doctor, and probably most important, the local garage man. Um, the rest of the faculty used to say, uh, well, they don't play poker. They sit around deciding educational policy, which was indeed a myth. You can imagine if you tried to decide educational policy what the losers would have said. <laughs> Deal the <of> cards. <laughs> so, and this is a memory of that time. Stanley in it is Stanley Edgar Hyman, early dead. And Paul is Paul Terence Feely, the American painter, also early dead. Myth and ritual. You come down to a time in every poker game where the losers allow they've lost. The winners begin sneaking into their shoes under the covered table. You come down to that time, they all go home. And hard as it is to imagine a fat and rowdy ghost piss in his empty glass so as not to miss a hand, that's how it happens. Paul is gone and Stanley is gone. The winners have risen with cash and checks and promising papers and drifted through the cold door forever 
while the host, like some somnambulist or sleepy priest, empties their ashes into the dawn. And the third of this sequence seems to, they seem to go together. So to D, my sister, dead by her own hand. My dear, I wonder if before the end you ever thought about a children's game, I'm sure you must have played it too, in which you ran along a narrow garden wall pretending it to be a mountain ledge so steep a snowy darkness fell away on either side to deeps invisible. And when you felt your balance being lost, you jumped because you feared to fall and thought for only an instant, that was when I died. That was a life ago, and now you've gone who would no longer play the grown-up's game where balanced on the ledge above the dark, you go on running and you don't look down nor ever jump because you fear to fall. Well. I should read a slightly longer poem, that sort of, sort of uh, then everybody can be excused. Like, this is an, a long poem by me, is like five minutes long. It's called The Painter Dreaming in the Scholar's House, and it's in memory of the painters Paul Clay and the Paul Terence Felia, who was in the other poem. Mostly about Clay, Paul Felia was not quite like this, he was he was one of the wisest men I had ever met, but he never said anything more intellectual than up your giggy with a giggy hook and that at, <laughs> um, that at poker games. But a very wise man, dead at 55 of leukemia. Though this is mostly about Paul Clay, really. And it's in four parts. One, called The Painter Dreaming in the Scholar's House. The painter's eye follows relation out. His work is not to paint the visible, he says, it is to render visible. Being a man and not a god, he stands already in a world of sense from which he borrows to begin with mental things chiefly, the abstract elements of language, the point, the line, the plane, the colors, and the geometric shapes. Of these, he spins relation out he weaves its fabric up so that it speaks darkly as music does, singing the secret history of the mind. And when in this the visible world appears as it does do, mountain, flower, cloud, and tree, all haunted here and there with the human face, it happens as by accident, although the accident is of design. It is because language first rises from the speechless world that the painterly intelligence can say correctly that he makes his world, not imitates the one before his eyes. Hence the delightsome gardens, the dark shores, the terrifying forests where nightfall enfolds a lost and tired traveler. And hence the careless crowd deludes itself by likening his hieroglyphic signs and secret alphabets to the drawing of a child. That likeness is significant the other side of what they see, for his simplicities are not the first ones but the furthest ones, final refinements of his thought made visible. He is the painter of the human mind, finding and faithfully reflecting the mindfulness that is in things and not the things themselves. For such a man, art is an act of faith. Prayer the study of it, as Blake says, and praise the practice. Nor does he divide making from teaching or from theory. The three are one. And in his hours of art, there shines a happiness through darkest themes, as though spirit and sense were not at odds. Two, the painter as an allegory of the mind at Genesis. He takes a burlap bag, tears it open, and tacks it on a stretcher. He paints it black because, as he has said, everything looks different on black. 
Suppose the burlap bag to be the universe and black because its volume is the void before the stars were. At the painter's hand, volume becomes one-sidedly a surface and all his depths are on the face of it. Against this flat abyss, this groundless ground of zero thickness stretched against the cold, dark silence of the absolutely not, material worlds arise, the colored earths and oil of plants that imitate the light. They imitate the light that is in thought, for the mind relates to thinking as the eye relates to light. Only because the world already is a language can the painter speak according to his grammar of the ground. It is archaic speech that has not yet divided out its cadences in words. It is a language for the oldest spells about how some thoughts rose into the mind while others stranger still sleep in the world. So grows the garden green, the sun vermilion, as the rose flame up and fade and fall and be the same rose still, the radiant in red. He paints his language, and his language is the theory of what the painter thinks. Three. The painter's eye attends to death and birth together, seeing a single energy momently manifest in every form, as in the tree, the growing of the tree, exploding from the seed, not more nor less than from the void, condensing down and in, summoning sun and rain. He views the tree, the great tree, standing in the garden, saying, as thrusting downward its vast spread and weight, growing its green height from dark watered earth, and as suspended weightless from the sky, hailed forth and held up by the hair of its head. He follows through the flowing of the forms from the divisions of the trunk out to the veinings of the leaf and the leaf's fall. His pencil meditates the many in the one after the method in the confluence of rivers, the running of ravines on mountainsides and in the deltas of the nerves. He sees how things must be continuous with themselves as with whole worlds that they themselves are not in order that they may be so transformed. He stands where the eternity of thought opens upon perspective, time, and space. He watches mind become incarnate. Then he paints the tree. Four. <coughs> These thoughts have chiefly been about the painter Clay, about how he in our hard time might stand to us especially whose lives concern themselves with learning, as patron of the practical intelligence of art, and thence as model, modest and humorous in sufferings for all research that follows spirit where it goes. That there should be much goodness in the world much kindness and intelligence, candor and charm, and that it all goes down in the dust after a while. This is a subject for the steadiest meditations of the heart and mind, as for the tears that clarify the eye toward charity. So may it be to all of us that at some times in this bad time when faith in study seemed to fail, and when impatience in the street and still despair at home divide the mind to rule it, there shall some comfort come from the remembrance of so deep and clear a life as his, whom I have thought of for the wholeness of his mind, as the painter dreaming in the scholar's house, his dream an emblem to us of the life of thought, the same dream that then flared before intelligence, when light first went forth looking for the eye. So um, I think it's fair to offer everybody a chance to scram at this moment. And anybody wants to stay, I'll read you a few more little verses. Uh, you have to go well. To, uh, this is not to be taken as setting an example. <laughs> but I know that some of you uh, 
An hour of poetry reading would have me running for the exit. I can barely attend my own. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll all remain friends if you'd like to go, and then those who want to stay for 10 minutes at most more. Uh, we'll do. There'll be, uh, I think, three very sad poems, followed by two epigrams on the same subject to set it all right. Okay? I'm the one to say whether it's okay or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, the first of these sad, sad poems called Somewhere comes in three stanzas. Um, first, about the circumstance that wherever you are, within a block of you, what people are mostly doing is um, suffering their terrors quietly. And the second stanza, this is about, this is how it's set against the implacable permanence of both civilization and nature. Um, and the third attempts to put these incompatibles back together by saying all you ever do about it is sing a song, tell a story. And somehow um, these awful disasters, which remain immitigable disasters, turn into uh, what the, the folks call beauty. Huh? Well, it's a sinister business, probably a romantic poem. Somewhere. A girl this evening regrets her surrender with tears. A schoolboy knows he will be unprepared tomorrow. A father, aware of having behaved viciously, is unable to speak. His child weeps obstinately. Somewhere a glutton waits for himself to vomit. An unfaithful wife resists the temptation to die. The stones of the city have been here for centuries. The tides have been washing backward and forward in sunlight, in starlight, since before the beginning. Down in the swamp, a red fox runs quietly, quietly under the owl's observation, those yellow eyes that eat through the darkness, hear the shrill cry. Somewhere a story is told. Someone is singing of careless love in the hands of its creditors. It is of Isolt, Antigone, Tarquin with Lucrece, the brides in the bath. Those who listen lean forward bemused, wrapped with the sweet seductions punishable by death, with the song's word, long ago. And the, the second of the three kind of focuses on one example of of that sort of thing that we started out with. About um, once you've thought something, you cannot have not thought it. Once the letter comes with the dreadful news, you cannot not have seen it. It's about, you know, waiting for the mail on a nice morning, and here's an old lady whom you love, respect, and admire, and her daughter has killed herself. So called these words also. There is her mother's letter on the table where it was opened and read and put down in a morning remaining what it never was, remaining what it will not be again. These words also earth the sun brings forth in the moment of his unbearable brilliancy. After a night of drink and too much talk, after the casual companions had gone home, she did this. How the silence must have grown austere as the unanswerable phone rang in a room that wanted to be empty. The garden holds its sunlight heavy and still as if in a gold frame around the flowers that nod and never change, the picture book flowers of somebody's forbidden childhood. Pale lemony lilies, pansies with brilliant scowls pretending to be children. Only they live, and it is beautiful enough to live. 
having to do with hunger and reflection, a matter of thresholds, of thoughtless balancings. The black and gold morning goes on, and what is a girl's life? There on the path, red ants are pulling a shiny beetle along through the toy kingdom where nobody thinks. And the last of the sequence, uh, called De Anima, after Aristotle's marvelous, crazy essay, Perisike, about the soul, which I read when I was 18, must have had some illusion that I understood. After I wrote the poem at about age 45, I guess, um, I've come back and read that essay, and I couldn't even entertain the illusion that Aristotle understood it any longer. <laughs> But it's my little le legend about the soul, the psyche, the anima. Um, depends again on a simple figure that everyone has seen and been so impressed by, you wonder whether there aren't as many poems about it as poems comparing girls with roses, which we appear to have got from uh, Muslims. Well, no lectures, all right. Um, Girls don't look much like roses, really. <laughs> no. um, the image is when you stand in a lighted room, you're warm and at home, you look out the window at night, you cannot see outside, you can only get you and the room behind you. But someone who is in excluded from all this comfort across the street, let's suppose it's a, it's a very cold night, he's not comfortable, but he can see you quite clearly. So this is the beginning of many romances, but this one doesn't happen. And at the end of it, I appeal to that figure of Cupid, who was so popular since the Renaissance. When I went to the movies in New York as a kid, the proscenium march is full of tumbling, gilt, plaster, flaking, butted Cupids. I never, not being a very thoughtful little boy, I never thought about it till I saw much later in the National Gallery in Washington a picture by Greco where he gets the same effect, but instead of Cupid's little fat babies, he's got uh, skulls with the wings of bats doing the same sort of thing. You see. So I thought, oh, now I get the idea what Cupid's about. He's um, You think that you're just having fun, but no, he's saying, you and you, into the sack. I, even if it's sin, even if it's the fall, I want to get in the act. See? So he's going to produce himself at all costs. By some chance, I come across a figure of Cupid from the Hindu stories, when he's called Kama, Cupid's opposite number, which I thought appropriate. He, he too, is blind and has a bow and arrow with infallible aim. But his bow is made of honeybees, his arrows are made of candy tipped with flowers. Sort of queasy sentimental eroticism that could put a stop to generation entirely if you thought much upon it. <laughs> um, so he gets in the act just at the end. De anima. Now it is night. Now in the brilliant room, a girl stands at the window looking out, but sees in the darkness of the frame only her own image. And there is a young man across the street who looks at the girl and into the brilliant room. They might be in love, might be about to meet if this were a romance. In looking at herself, she tries to look beyond herself and half become another admiring and resenting, maybe dreaming her lover might see her so. The other, the stranger standing in cold and dark, looks at the young girl in her crystalline room. He sees clearly and hopelessly desires a life that is not his. Given the blindness of her self-possession, the luminous vision revealed to his despair, we look to both sides of the glass at once and see no future in it. These pure divisions hurt us in some realm of parable beyond belief, beyond the temporal mind. Why is it sorrowful? Why do we want them together? 
Is it the spirit ransacking through the earth after its image, its being, its begetting? The spirit sorrows for what lovers bring into the world is death, the most exclusive romance after all, the sort that lords and ladies listen to with selfish tears when she draws down the shade, when he has turned away, when the blind embryo with his bow of bees, his candied arrows tipped with flower heads, turns from them too, for mercy or for grief, refusing to be, refusing to die. Well, it is said that in the ancient Greek theater, they, uh, you, after the tragic trilogy, they used to have satyr plays in which the same themes and the same characters appeared, but discussed in terms of the most merciless obscenity and rudeness. You can imagine none of these things, these satyr plays, has survived, but I can imagine why. The actors must have known their lines thoroughly by then and be heartily sick of some of them, too. And the jokes would just come up naturally. Nobody would ever have to write anything down. Um, it's the, all the story of tragedy and comedy is the story of the mind and the body, or the spirit and the body. It's, it's, it's very simple. Everything, everything lofty has its funny. It's, um, it, it's funny and rather demonic counterpart in the bodily, in the flesh. You know? so I got two nasty, dirty epigrams for you. I hope you can stand them. Gee, they're not as nasty or dirty as that. The first one is called Don Juan to the Statue, and it is, it is um, reminiscent of Mozart's Don Giovanni, where, uh, well, everybody knows it, Don Giovanni. I'll just remind you briefly of the circumstance. Uh, when Don Giovanni tries to, at the beginning, either seduce or rape, according to the whim of the producer, um, the daughter, Donna Anna, of the commandant of the garrison at Seville. Um, Daddy rushes out like a true soldier and defends his girl's honor and gets killed. Uh, Donna Anna, like a good girl, puts up a twice life-size statue of her daddy, the commandant, in the local cemetery. Then the marvelous fusions and obliquities of plot the next act, when Don Giovanni and his servant Leporello are escaping from the enraged parents and uh, relatives and friends of another girl he's done, to, done wrong, they hop over the wall into the cemetery, and there they are looking up at the statue of the Commendatore in full moonlight. And Don Giovanni, who's pretty brave, says, uh, Leporello, ask him to supper. And Leporello, in a very funny, quavering song, asks the statue to supper, which is amazing enough, but not as amazing as when the statue in D minor accepts. <laughs> so the next day, next night, there they are, Don Giovanni and Leporello, preparing dinner. They're in a banquet room, a restaurant. There are two little orchestras on the stage. One of them is even playing pieces of Mozart. And, oh, Don Giovanni said, oh yeah, I know that one. Uh, he ought to. He's in a piece by Mozart. And they're not talking about anything more important than, uh, you know, tell Leporello he shouldn't talk with his mouth full. When just at that moment, these marble feet <laughs> on the stair, a statue comes in, and there ensues a a little back and forth thing with the statue saying, repent, and Don Giovanni saying, I won't, I won't, repent, I won't, and so forth. Not even Mozart could make much out of that. Uh, finally, Don Giovanni, temerarious as ever, advances across the floor to welcome his guest and gets his fist crushed in that marble fist and vanishes below to hellfire in clouds of muriatic acid. Whereupon the rest of the cast finally found the restaurant. The crumb bums, who are neither that good nor that evil, assemble and sing a silly little catch called uh, That's What Happens to Bad Guys. And questo il fin di chi fa mal. 
Um, Mozart doesn't write anything for Don Giovanni to say at the end except, ah, oh, oh, and I probably don't even have the intonation right, the interval right. I thought if we could just push the opera apart. Have to float through these things. It's going to turn out I don't have it. Ah, that'll save you a lot of bother, won't it? Why shouldn't it be here? Oh, well, here it is. You see, instead of de anima in the learned tongue, we have, frankly, on the soul. And I guess it's based on the fact that in my freshman philosophy course, I had to read about how Descartes had discovered that the seat of the soul was the pineal gland, something up here which later physiologists thought was uh, the remnant of a third eye. I don't know what they think now, but I'm sure it isn't that. It sounds so stupid. Um, <laughs> And then 20 years later, I read the reason he thought it was the seat of the soul was that the gland had two little dents in it where the soul's butt sat down. He <laughs> said, there again, you see a soul and body. You can talk about the one only in terms of the other. It gets us into lots of trouble. So I thought somehow for all, this is my contribution to philosophical thought, by the way, so take it with great solemnity. There is one example in the world where thought and flesh respond instantly. The prick was the priest that in the first place joined in wedlock the heavy body with the light mind. The prick stands at the head of every sect. It is the prick that keeps saying only connect. The dean of St. Patrick's had the word if you'd hear it. The thorn in the flesh has become a spur to the spirit. The prick is the soul philosophers should have sought. A kid can get a hard on from pure thought. <laughs> well, okay, thank you.